Uh, I'm Andy Winnick. I'm the president of the American Institute for Progressive Democracy. That was one of the founding uh, organizations that conceived of the conference and did a lot of the reorganizing for it. Uh, there are four other co-sponsors that I do want to make sure we mention. Scripps College has uh, donated the use of this hall, which is not, it's a big deal, and also some of the lunch, fa lunch facilities. Other sponsors of the conference are the Three Valleys Municipal Water District. Uh, they, they, have, they are a sponsor of the program as well. Uh, Pomona College, uh, Scripps College, the Robert Redford Conservancy for Sustainability at Pitzer, Pitzer College, and the five colleges environmental um, analysis program, which spans all of the colleges, are also co-sponsoring uh, the, the, this uh, conference. Um, the other thing I want to mention is we do have, I think, courtesy of the state, I guess, um, the uh, pamphlets and information about the topic that, that was just discussed of the Barrier Delta, the Bay Delta Con Conservancy District, and there are materials that will be available, and if you'd like, they'll be passed out as you leave the auditorium, so at least you can get some of the I guess I should call it official propaganda and look at all that stuff and be, be better informed to perhaps comment on it. Uh, it was also asked to mention that there are a number of projects that are going on on the Claremont College's campus and uh, there's one talking about irrigation with recycled water, uh, the uh, Harvey Mudd's Engineers for a Sustainable World, uh, they're doing that, and there's a number of other projects, and I think Char may mention one that he's been working on for the Claremont College area as well. So the, we're trying to lead by example, not just by rhetoric. Alrighty, so uh, the point of the, the four sessions, as was mentioned, we started with a global perspective, went to a national perspective. What we just finished was trying to look at California as a state, and now we're trying to really focus in on the Southern California regional aspect. We have uh, five very distinguished speakers who are incredibly well informed about that. Uh, again, if you haven't looked at it, please, I'll mention who they are. Uh, I will not read their bios because you have that in the program. So if you look in your program, you can find details about each of them. In order, uh, Char Miller, who is the W.M. Keck Professor of Environmental Analysis at, Pro at Pomona College and the coordinator for the Claremont College's Environmental Analysis Program, will lead. The second speaker is Richard Atwater, who's the Executive Director for the Southern California Water Committee and has done a lot with water throughout this area. The third speaker is Richard Boone, who's the Chief for the Orange County Stormwater Project and has been working in that area in various capacities for many years. The fourth speaker is Ken Manning, who was also speaking in Claremont this morning, for those of you who were at the fracking conference, uh, who is the executive director of the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority, and the top title pretty well tells you what it is he is doing. And finally, uh, my notes here, Megan Brousseau, who's the program director for the Inland Empire Water Keepers. So you'll notice that all of these speakers have a good deal of expertise and experience in the regional water issues here. And with that, we will start. Char, do you want to begin? Thank you very much. Um, my real job today is to get out of the way so that this crowd can speak. Part of my job, it seems to me, is to really set up their conversation, and their conversation, to my mind, is actually the most important because it is about the places where we all live. It's the land on which we walk. The water is beneath our feet, but it's a landscape that we don't think much about. And it's part of what I think this conference's goal is, is not only to frame the global issues that we've been addressing, but to bring those down to this landscape and to the worlds that we inhabit so very closely. Um, to do that, I'm also going to talk to you a bit about a world that didn't happen, uh, which is why we have been having these conversations about the tangle of social, political, economic, and environmental issues, as well as the national, state, regional, and local tensions that have emerged from that. Um, but I want to start really with talking about and setting some of the background of the things that we do know. We do know, as Noah and others have demonstrated, uh, what the seasonal drought outlook looks like. We have some sense, as Branwyn Williams told us earlier this morning, how that seasonal outlook lines up against 
the broader um, systems that are seeming to ally that might well in fact create greater drought for this region across time. But this is our future future, the close future that we need to be paying some attention to. We understand too, as you have been reading in the newspapers across the last several set of years, that the Mississippi River is having trouble, that they're having to, to dredge it constantly to make sure that the barges that are flowing out of the upper Midwest get down to New Orleans at all. The mighty Mississippi is not quite as mighty as it once was. Um, the mighty Ogallala isn't either. And I think one of the central tensions for the Great Plains and the great agricultural production that takes place there uh, are those gas-driven pumps that we have heard about that in, emerged in California in the late 19th century that were put to that water in the post-World War II period um, and that has begun to drain that landscape in ways that is tough because, in fact, this is an aquifer that cannot be replenished. Um, and once it's gone, it's gone. And so that's going to do really serious damage to Kansas agriculture as well as many other places in the High Plains. And we need to be thinking about that because that, too, is the source not only of our food but of a lot of other people along the planet. You know full well because of all of the coverage um, that has been taking place over the last three to four months alone that our landscape is under great stress, uh, no place greater than that than the Sierra itself. Uh, when they went to look for snowpack this year, and it was kind of fun watching the news counts of it as they watched the people looking for the snow, that they, could have, they had a hard time to figure out not just the percentage of water in that snowpack, but a snowpack that they could actually measure. If you add to that, as Bramwin suggested, we have to think about the bigger implications across time than this set of maps coming uh, to you about historic averages, lower warming average, that is to say, do we think the emissions are going to change it to what set of degrees across the next century? It isn't simply that we may get less snow, but the snow, the, what we will get is precipitation, that is to say rain, and that doesn't come in the winter in quite the way, I mean, once it hits the ground, it moves, as opposed to snow, which nicely stays up in the mountains and then is slowly released. These are issues that we know about and that we need to be addressing. And then there's the legal set of questions. This is a, um, the Eagle Butte on the Grand, Rio Grande, um, but it is emblematic of a lot of places. Reservoirs that were built early in the 21st century to control floods, to provide water for irrigation, that crossed state boundaries those waters, and now, of course, Texas and New Mexico are involved in lawsuits over that flow and who actually controls it, as Texas is also in lawsuits with Oklahoma over the Red River. And my guess is um, those legal battles are only going to increase across time. So not just climate change, not just population booms, but also spikes in legal activities and judicial actions uh, that will now become more the norm than they already have been. Uh, and then final piece, in a sense, because it's so important to Southern California, is the Colorado River. It supplies upwards to 30 to 40 million people with their water. It's an extraordinary manufactured landscape, a great plumbing system. It has done amazing things, and those dams and reservoirs and tunnels are really quite technological marvels. But it depends on that, not the ski resorts because uh, I couldn't find a really clean shot. And besides, who doesn't want to know about skiing? Um, but you can't ski if there's no snow, and you don't drink water if there's no snow or less snow. And so this whole system that has been predicated and literally encased in concrete is now a fixed target, in a sense, for a broader shifting climate that may not, in fact, drop its snow on those Rockies. Three years ago, Denver was a little shocked to watch the snowstorms skip across those mountains and drop east of the city when all of its tunnels go west. And if you fix things that are not mobile in this regard and nature decides to thumb its nose at you and move the water where you're not able to take it in, then you're in jeopardy. Um, and so in ways that we need to be thinking about, um, what we have built are systems that are static in a landscape that is in fact moving, a climate that is moving in a meteorological world that is shifting. And as Bramwood said at the, ups, at the uptake today, um, we don't actually know what's going to happen. Our guess is the drier will get drier and the wetter will stay the same or get somewhat wetter. So think Vancouver in case you want to move. But this tells its own story, these bathtub rings of 100 and 120 feet. So we understand those symbols. But I want to propose 
a, a sort of a counter story, a counter narrative that, as I mentioned at the, ups at the start, didn't happen. The story that didn't occur, the one that does not depend, in effect, precisely on this kind of um, infrastructure. And so this is Lake Powell. Lake Powell named for John Wesley Powell, the great explorer of the Colorado River, the second head of the USGS, um, and a figure of considerable importance to the story that didn't happen. Powell, as you may know, uh, is the first, as best we can tell, and certainly he would make this claim, uh, the first to navigate down the Colorado River, um, in and of itself crazy in the 1860s, crazier still, he only had one arm, uh, crazier on a third level, it's, these are on wooden boats, highly inflexible things uh, that rocketed down an untamed river that is pretty wild. Um, but what's so, so interesting to me about Powell's experience running down those rivers is that he's noticing the landscape through which he goes and starts to think about, at that lower surface level, about everything that's above him that he cannot see. He doesn't have the value that we have, which is to fly over it and actually to see these terrains. His vision is framed around geographical systems um, and geological forms that lead him to start to think about these drainage basins whose mouths he's flashing by as he's roaring down this river, but to be thinking about navigating, they go, hmm, that's interesting. What are the connections between these tributaries and this river? And to start to formulate a new vision of this place framed around this map that he will create and his peers will create, his professional colleagues will create of the Colorado River is important because he reached a conclusion based on the landforms that he flashed past, which is these basins are really ought to be the physical constraints that define human life in the arid west. That it's watersheds that matter more than anything, that nature has provided us with a clue to see that water system and live within it and, the, and the, whatever supply it has for us. Uh, these well-defined boundary lines, as he says, this region should be organized into what he called natural hydraulic um, districts. In other places, he calls them commonwealths. I'm going to tweak it by my own title, is that call them watershed commonwealths. That the places that we live within are the places that are our common wealth, but also the places where we have communal interactions, that that's what defines how we might have lived in the arid American West. And because pre-GIS, they actually believed in aesthetic forms by which to define this, this is this gorgeous map that USGS built in the 1870s to see what those commonwealths might have looked like. And that, therefore, there is no state of Colorado. There would be a different articulation of the landscape. Colorado would not have straight lines. It would be this jagged thing that flowed along the river. And in a way, that is how the West should now look. There'd be a lot more states, a lot more senators, by the way, a great deal more representation. I don't know what they were thinking, but in truth, what they're thinking is much like this quarter, they think straight lines. Get out those survey chains, and a survey chain runs like this, and if that happened in Virginia, why shouldn't it happen going up and over the Rocky Mountains? It's crazy aesthetically, it makes no sense in terms of how watershed functions, and even as he's articulating this in the 1860s and 1870s, the game is already over. The world that Powell would want to come into being can't come into being um, because of that hidden history that Heather talked about, sort of there already were these structures that framed life in a certain way so that this map will not come true or the re-articulation of this map most recently in the last year, uh, the United States, the United Watershed States of America, um, it sort of defies your capacity to think it through until you start to think how important water is groundwater and surface water, but it's this in this case is the superficial part, that is to say, the landforms themselves. It changes how we think about place. And if nothing else, it seems to me, that's absolutely essential to this broader story. So let me give you an example from Texas where there has been an attempt 
not entirely successful, but an attempt to start to rethink how people think about land and the water that lay beneath their feet. This is the Edwards Aquifer, which Rick Hazlitt had a wonderful illustration of at the, at the underground piece, how these things actually function. But it turns out, when you have an endangered lawsuit uh, uh, suit in the 1990s against San Antonio, um, that will produce an incredible political reaction, which is we have to defend the ecological values of this underground thing, the size of which we actually don't know. And one of the ways to do that is to build a regional institution that is in fact framed around that aquifer with some loopholes accepted and the water flows that come out of it. And a remarkable attempt to do what Powell said we might have done, but it's a layering on top of county lines, as you can see, on cities and the like. Um, it's been a really interesting experiment and by and large has worked pretty well, um, which is striking because no one in the mid-1990s thought it would work at all. So the fact that the thing is still extant and is still shaping the politics of Central South Texas around one of the great karst aquifers on the planet uh, is really quite striking. Southern California has its own um, emblems of this um, and it is starting to take place and that's why I've got to get out of the way of these people uh, because they're actually the folks who are working on the ground in the same way. Um, there's this wonderful article from the early part of the 20th century that's in the archives here. It has no sourcing so I have no idea where it came from. Um, but it talks about how Southern California could avoid Babylon's fate. And at the heart of the argument is not the importate, importing of water from other places, but in fact those aquifers and those basins that lay down on the ground as people were living it. And those of you who live in Claremont know there's an organization called the Pomona Valley Protective Association. When I first moved back here in 2007, I thought it was a mobbed up group. Um, turns out it's not. It's a 19th century attempt, or late, late 19th, early 20th century effect, attempt to protect those spreading grounds, as they were called. A really interesting progressive era notion that you actually paid attention to the ground and you put water on it, let it percolate back down into the aquifer, which were issues that were well aware to me, uh, quite aware uh, in terms of what San Antonio was doing back at the same time. And so part of what we're looking at is going back to some of that past. We can't recover necessarily those watershed commonwealths that Powell thought we ought to do, but we can certainly pay attention to these landscapes. Um, and here with this photograph of the 1938 flood tells you exactly how this land once looked, how those waters once flowed across this land, and how in fact this place um, dealt with, uh, for those of you who know Big Bridges is this massive building in the foreground, those waters coming out of the San Antonio um, uh, Canyon. I mean, that is our watershed. That snow on those mountains, that water flowing down, that's the place where we live and that's the landscape, it seems to me, that we best defend, best think about because it's what we best know, except we don't. And so that's the piece that we have to teach ourselves, relearn in this process. And the shot uh, from the new dorms at Pomona raises that process up in another set of directions. We have rooftops, not just to collect solar, but also to collect water. And one of the cool, geeky little pieces of this building is any water that hits this building or flows across its footprint will be captured by the building itself tunneled down underneath 6th Street and flushed into the wash that lies to the immediate east side of Pomona's campus so that it will percolate back into the aquifer. It's living in place, thinking about place and the role that every building plays in that articulation of this landscape that becomes so vitally important. Um, and yet, I have to end on the same note that Branwyn ended. I had the slide first, just so you know. Um, but, but it does raise the question of whether even Powell's vision and this idealized notion of people living in common and common places that depend upon common resources that are their common wealth can actually survive if we live and to, to, and if we enter into the higher emission scenario. I think the actual process of change will then kick in, which will be that people will leave. Because if, as Rick Hazlitt said, these basins might be able to support on their own 800,000 people, 
call it a million just to round it up a bit. And if, in fact, we lose water from the Colorado and or uh, from the state water system, by cost or transfers decrease, then there is going to have to be an out-migration from this region. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for the region. After all, in 1950, none of this or very little of this population was here or in Phoenix or in Tucson or in Salt Lake or in Denver or in any of the places that blew up in the Sun Belt uh, from the 1970s onwards. Uh, so some of that migratory process, I think, will be a way by which we vent population out to other places, which has only been here for 50 years or so. Um, but I think the larger implications for us now here is to actually listen to the soul, good souls on this, on this panel uh, who are going to talk about the very issues that it seems to me at our feet, in our terrain, in our place and time, what it is that we can do. Thanks very much. Um, let me just give you a little background. Um, I've worked in Southern California for about 30-some years on water issues. And, and one of the things I'm really proud of is that in Southern California in the last 20 years, we've really changed that paradigm. We've talked about the Colorado River, the LA Aqueduct, its 100th anniversary, which co coincidentally is also the 100th anniversary of San Francisco taking water from Yosemite. And so that was the era 100 years ago, both San Francisco and Oakland and Southern California, LA took water from Northern California, of course, the state aqueduct. But what I want to talk about is what we're doing in Southern California to be more self-sustainable. Uh, this is kind of where we are today. And what I'd like to highlight, this is our water supplies for about 19 to 20 million people. Uh, we talked about BDCP, the state water project. It's about 30%, and it really varies a lot. If you're in San Diego, you're 90% dependent on imported water from the Colorado River and Northern California. Here in Claremont, you're about 50-50. Uh, you, you go across the county line, you go over to Upland, uh, Montclair, Rancho Cucamonga, you're uh, about 75% local supplies. And I'll talk about how they've made improvements to that to kind of drought-proof the area and what you can do here in Claremont. And then, of course, our local groundwater basins, stormwater capture, water recycling. Um, what I want to talk about, two things. Uh, Peter Glick did a really nice job of talking about the future and what we can do Two good news stories. One, the state of California adopted a California Water Action Plan, which in essence, in the details, is consistent with what Peter talked about. And probably more good news to all of you is last week the governor declared a press conference, talked about the drought, how serious it was, got a lot of news coverage. I know it's hard to believe, but our legislature almost unanimously within one week passed a bill and the governor signed into law today and authorized $670 million for emergency funding related to the drought. And every one of these items here was included in that bill. Money for more water recycling, conservation, groundwater, stormwater capture, all of the above. And so that's one of the things I'd like to talk about, not only what we've done in the past, but how we can do more of that in the future, not just here, but throughout Southern California, and as we all agreed and earlier speakers highlighted, it is one state. It's the responsibility of every community to, to develop more local, sustainable supplies. So let me just give you a little background. The last drought, and that's one of the things I'd like to highlight, I'm always an optimist. Uh, in 1988 to 1992, Santa Barbara, Lake Kachuma, if you know Santa Barbara, was empty. They were doing 50% water rationing. They installed in 1990 a seawater desalinization plant. Um, in 1992, they had the March Miracle. They sold it to the Mideast because they didn't need it anymore. But it changed forever, water management in Santa Barbara. But I also will tell you, in Southern California, this is what happened. In 1990, we sold the most imported water we ever have in 1990 before the drought hit here in 91, 92. And, and Metropolitan Water District has never sold as much water in the last 25 years. We've added 5 million people, and if you look at the per capita consumption, somebody mentioned LA, yes, they've added over a million people since 1977, 78, and they don't use any more water. In Southern California, from San Diego to Ventura County, you can say the same thing from 1990 today. We don't use any more water. 
and will continue. And if you look out the next 20 or 30 years, the strategy, as Peter and others have talked about, increasing local supplies, stormwater, water recycling, groundwater, conservation, all of that's going to increase. This just gives you just a, a, at a macro level for the whole region, um, some of the fun facts, is since the, we had a dry period and we lost about a third of our water supply, 2007, 2008, 2009, some of you may remember that, about a third of our water supply from Northern California was because the pumps were shut off because of the Delta Smelt Endangered Species Act. And that's one of the arguments that if we could have installed the tunnels, not arguing pro and con, but if you had installed the tunnels, that water could have been stored and used for future droughts. And one of the things that's happened as a result of that drought is per capita consumption, partly because of the economic recession, all that. But in today, we've reached our targets on reductions. In, in the state law in 2009, the co-equal goals that were talked about a little bit earlier, we've reduced our per capita consumption in Southern California by about 15 to 20% in the last six or seven years. And given the governor's call for additional 20% conservation, our expectation in the water industry in Southern California is per capita con consumption will go down probably by 2015 to about 25 to 30%. The Metropolitan Water District has doubled their conservation budget, as an example, from 20 million to 40 million. They did that two weeks ago. And every city and jurisdiction in Southern California are adding money to promote more water conservation because of the statewide drought. Let me just give you an example. Here on campus, uh, one of the things, uh, when you walk around, examples what, this, uh, what has happened historically, you probably haven't thought about it, you've been reducing your water use on campus. The new landscapes, the new buildings on campus have low water use landscapes. And of course, one of the, the great resources of Southern California here in Claremont which I don't know if you're aware of it, but with the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Gardens, you've got one of the great research centers in the, in the state on native, beautiful, low-use water landscapes. In fact, I used to spend a lot of time uh, working with them, doing research on using recycled water to irrigate their plants so we don't even use any potable water for them. Another example, here's the, the here on campus, I don't know if you recognize it, but it's the Claremont University Consortium building. You have lots of lead buildings uh, on all the campuses, and all of them are very energy and water efficient. That's the future. You're going to get, reduce your outdoor water use and have these types of landscapes. Another example. Another. The other opportunities, not only in Claremont, but what it's happened since the last drought, in Southern California, we spent over $10 billion on new water recycling projects, groundwater cleanup, groundwater storage. I'll give you a couple examples of that. Uh, desalinization, everybody talks about the billion dollar um, seawater desalinization plant down in Carlsbad, and Peter Glick's right, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and even for San Diego, it's a 5% solution. It's a 50 million gallon per day plant, uh, but only represents 5%. So it's not like seawater desalinization is going to uh, drought-proof all of Southern California. And there's also a practical problem. You can build them on the coast, but we're not going to build large diameter pipes and ship the water up to Claremont, or much less go from Huntington Beach to uh, you know, Anaheim. It's just incredibly too expensive to move the water uphill. So it's only uh, along the coast. And when you think about the region, it only provides, again, like a 3 or 5% solution, and at that point, be very expensive. The opposite, I would say, is there is a lot of groundwater treatment using desalinization. Uh, here locally, uh, Pomona has been desalting high nitrate well water for a long time. We, we built down in the Chino, uh, Ontario area, desalinization plants along the Santa Ana River. And in Riverside and Orange County, there's many plants like that, and also up in Ventura County. Let me talk a little bit about water recycling. Uh, we talked about the legislation, the drought in 1988 to 1992. Uh, talking about the Central Valley Project legislation in 1992. 
One of the things that happened coming out of that drought is Congress authorized federal legislation for grants for water recycling. 80% of all those grants that were available to the Western United States were invested in Southern California. The West Basin Project was the first ever built. Orange County, the world's largest water recycling plant, was built with federal and state grants. Um, up and down throughout Southern California, we built water recycling projects. Um, the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts are kind of a world leader. They've been doing this on the San Gabriel River for the last 50 years. The first water recycling in Southern California was in Pomona in 1924. Cal Poly Pomona has been on water recycling as an example uh, since the 1970s. And there's about a dozen other colleges from Cal State Long Beach, UC Irvine, Pepperdine, Loyola Marymount, Whittier College, all have been on recycled water for over a decade. When you talk about water recycling, we can use it for a lot of purposes. And I just would highlight here on campus, they're, they're doing a, a study to evaluate uh, Peter Glick talked about decentralized approaches. You're really far. It's not practical to move purple pipe from one of the existing plants to the Claremont colleges. So we're looking at options of putting a plant on campus to use it for outdoor irrigation. And ultimately, you can use it as they do in Irvine and Glendale, uh, uh, the Inland Empire Utilities Agency office down in Chino. You use it for toilet flushing, for cooling towers, um, we use it in refineries. We use it for a whole host of purposes, not just outdoor landscaping. And of course, there are many parts of Southern California that's part of their drinking supply. If you live in uh, Upland or Rancho Cucamonga or Ontario, uh, as I always jokingly say, that if you, if you go to Disneyland, between the wastewater that comes down from the upper Santa Ana River watershed and the Orange County plant, 90% of the tap water at Disneyland is from wastewater origin. In fact, there's no other place in the United States that uses more recycled water than the Santa Ana River watershed. And the sec second most uh, largest use of recycled water is the San Gabriel River watershed. Let me just talk a little bit about groundwater. Um, certainly, uh, Ken will talk about this a lot more locally. Um, when we talk about our water supplies, this just illustrates the challenge and why it really made sense to form the Metropolitan Water District back in the 1920s, originally with the 13 cities, but as this area grew from Ventura County to San Diego. The color areas, and of course, just highlight where you are. This is the Six Basin Claremont, and a little hydrology watershed note. Claremont, uh, the San Antonio Creek, is in the Santa Ana River watershed, in the western part of town, and as you get over to Laverne, that flows into the San Gabriel River. Mount Baldy, Mount Baldy to the coast is 30 miles. 10,000 feet to the coastline, it's probably the steepest watershed as far as elevation change and the shortest amount of distance anywhere on the globe. So that's why when it rains and we have fires and floods, it's tough to capture water. But one of the things we're doing in the last 72 hours, San Antonio Dam, San Antonio Creek, that water is being stored and released and is recharging, not only here in the Six Basin, but it's going down in, over in Upland in recharge basins into the Chino Groundwater Basin. And both Pomona and Upland and Montclair pump from that. And actually Golden State has a couple wells in the Chino Basin, which helps the supply for Claremont. My big point about the Groundwater Basin is one of the reasons why we have these basins in the storage amounts uh, one of the things that we've, we've done really successfully since the last drought is we have wet years, like 2010, 1998. We store in Southern California surplus imported water, both from the Colorado River and Northern California. We are now aggressively trying to use recycled water and capture more stormwater in all these basins so that we can, um, as Henry Barr Bulls had talked about, the opportunity in the San Gabriel Valley, similarly over in the Chino Basin, over in the Rancho Cucamonga, Ontario area, and here in Upland, right across the county line, is we stored water in 2007, 2008, 2009. Cities like Upland, uh, Montclair, Rancho Cucamonga, Ontario, cut their imported water use in half and went all to groundwater. In fact, for months, they had zero imported water because we had the operational capability to do that. 
That's the way we help stretch these supplies. Groundwater storage is much more cost effective. Diamond Valley is a wonderful reservoir, but for $3 billion, we could uh, uh, double the storage capacity in all the groundwater basins in Southern California. And that's what we ought to be working on. This is just an example of, of what's already been implemented after spending about a billion and a half dollars in the last 15 years in the Chino Basin. One, whoops, excuse me, I clicked the wrong way. Stormwater capture off of Mount Baldy in the San Gabriel Mountains, um, we increased um, by about double the amount of average annual stormwater. Obviously, you gotta have rain. When it doesn't rain, uh, we don't get a lot, but when we have a wet year, we capture all that stormwater. The other key point is we build at the bottom end of the river because we worry about the historic Route 66, orange lemon groves, vineyards, of course the dairies down in the Chino area, high nitrate pollution. We cleaned up the groundwater and spent $300 million on groundwater desalinization plants, and that represents for the city of Chino, and Riverside community, uh, Harupa, Norco, Chino Hills, Ontario, about 20 to 35% of their drinking water supply comes from desalted groundwater. They also, um, one of the things, I don't know if Randall Lewis is here, he was here this morning, a Claremont alum, and many of you know him, but with Lewis Homes, the city of Chino built 7,000 new homes that it's 100% locally sustainable supply. All the outdoor irrigation in Chino is on recycled water. They get their drinking water from the desalting plant, and uh, in the long run, it, they, they, they're all on a self-sustainable local supply. And that's the opportunity you can do with a new housing construction. Let me just give you a little, you know, I, I showed you the groundwater map. One of the key things in why Claremont is in a critical position is when you look at the geology of the San Gabriel Mountains along both the San Gabriel and the Santa Ana River, being next to the mountains off of the alluvial fans is where we can get storm water, recycled water, we can percolate it in the underground. Just a simple diagram. Over here, if you, as you know, around the campus, as you go east over into Upland, you got all those big recharge pits, San Antonio Creek. That's places where we want to percolate water. Uh, and as you go downstream, and if you thought about it in, in the case of Chino, you can't percolate water there. Too silty. Um, the clay soils and all that. Basically, you can't put water in that groundwater basin when you get below the 10 freeway. So something to think about. Stormwater. Um, uh, Richard Boone will talk a lot more about it, but one of the things I want to highlight to all of you, throughout Southern California in the last decade, there's been a lot of effort to capture stormwater. Historically, the LA County Flood Control District and the other entities, like here in the Santa Ana River watershed too, to the, to the east of us, um, we've had lots of efforts, and we always have on artificial recharge. Um, but LA County on the San Gabriel River really led the way with rubber dams and the adjudication of the groundwater basins, where they'll work closely with the groundwater agencies. So when it rains, and in fact on Thursday I was over at LA County Public Works, and they were bragging that in the first day of the storm, they captured every drop of water that came down through the San Gabriel Mountains. If you know where Santa Fe Dam is on the 605 and the uh, 210 freeway, they captured that water and released it and put it in the, in the underground. Lastly, what I'd also like to point out to you, let's talk a little bit about you as a homeowner, what you can do. Stormwater capture, I agree with the whole concept that we need to do more distributive activities. And one of the things you can do at your home is install a rain barrel. And the Metropolitan Water District and the local agencies, everywhere from Ventura County to San Diego, we offer rebates for rain barrels. Uh, and then secondly, for your outdoor landscaping, and it's true, I've done it at my house, if you take your lawn out, uh, and we offer rebates everywhere in Southern California for outdoor water use to install efficient irrigation systems and incentivize you. And in fact, in some cities, like Long Beach, they offer about $3 a square foot, LA is $2 a square foot, but everywhere throughout Southern California, in, in here, including Claremont, you can get a rebate to take out your lawn and put in a, an efficient, low water use landscape. And of course, you got a luxury, you just wander over to Rancho Santa and Botanical Gardens and they got experts that will tell you how to do it really effectively. 
Here's the web page where you can find out about all that information, because obviously we don't have time today to get into all the opportunities, what you can do to do your own part of the conservation effort. Uh, but gray water use, uh, stormwater rain barrels, and both indoor and outdoor water use, there's lots of opportunities to do that. And here on campus, I think we also can see a lot of opportunities throughout the Claremont uh, community where you can reduce that 50% imported water, which by the way is plumbed to the State Water Project in Northern California. Um, really how do you reduce that and, and develop more of a reliable local supply? Thank you very much. Richard Boone is our next speaker, and he will talk about the whole issue of stormwater and stormwater capture. So I, I'm Richard Boone. I'm with um, County of Orange OC Public Works, OC Watersheds Division, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about what we're doing to manage stormwater in Orange County, but I, I think uh, if you're a student of stormwater, uh, or have an interest in stormwater, except that what we're doing, there are parallels in our adjacent counties uh, throughout the region. Um, two sort of very quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, we're now a division of around 45 uh, individuals with uh, backgrounds in environmental engineering or environmental sciences. If you're a student, we have a, uh, a very active internship program with paid and unpaid positions in my email comes up at the end if you're a student and you're interested in an intern position with OC Watersheds. Second, I will be talking today with a British accent. Uh, I, I have my, my daughters here, they're seventh grade El Roble students, they're dual citizens, they can translate <laughs> if, if there's any terminology that uh, I use that is unfamiliar. So the road, the, I can look at it here actually. The uh, roadmap just took, uh, this is a, a presentation that uh, hopefully is, is, is tailored to the broadest possible audience. So we're going to talk about Stormwater 101 and then get into some of the technical specifics of what we're doing in Orange County. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about regulation and management um, and why local government and flood control districts are, are moving slowly towards a greater and greater involvement in, in water supply through the, the mandates for water quality regulation. Uh, I'm going to touch on low impact development. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in public education and engagement in, in Orange County. Summary and then an opportunity for questions. So stormwater, I, I think we, we understand stormwater. It's that excess volume of water that is created at the land surface uh, that doesn't infiltrate. This is the EPA definition. You probably stepped in some. Uh, on your way into the theater today. And it occurs because when we, when humanity moves into a watershed and uh, the watershed is developed, undergoes urbanization, some fairly profound things happen. This is the, the land surface in the undeveloped condition. Uh, you'll see very, very little surface runoff in a, in a natural undisturbed landscape. 40% of the rainwater infiltrates. 30% evapo transpired back to, the, back to the atmosphere, and then 20% approximately flowing through uh, the soil horizons into, into uh, perennial or ephemeral streams. And this is a, a drawing from a, a handbook out of San Mateo, San Mateo County. And then obviously in the post-development conditions, some very profound things happen. Uh, we, we build impervious surfaces, we lay asphalt and concrete, we put up big box stores and homes and all of those things that um, we're familiar with. And the hydrologic cycle, that part of it that involves the landscape, changes very profoundly. Very little rainwater now infiltrates. A very significant quantity runs, off, runs straight off the surface water environment. There's less evapotranspiration and there's less interflow. So what, what, what are the environmental consequences of that? And I, I turned to um, the well-known hydrologist Jonathan Swift, who, who wrote a satiric piece uh, observing a rain event in central London back in the 1700s. Um, and, and, you, and you can read this. But what, 
what Jonathan is telling us is that there are four things that happen as a consequence of the developed condition of the landscape. That the volume of runoff increases. There's more water running off. It's running off at a faster rate. It picks up the detritus of human existence. That's the third thing. Filth of all hues and odors seem to tell what streets they sailed from by their sight and smell, what today we call fecal indicator bacteria. And then ultimately, as this stuff washes off and increased volumes and increased rates into the Thames in central London, then the Thames itself becomes less amenable as a, as a sort of a recreational resource. Uh, resource. So change in runoff quantity, change in runoff uh, velocity, change in runoff quality, and then an adverse impact on, on downstream receiving borders. So when uh, the, the, the sort of the rationale for addressing these adverse impacts um, was re the, the rationale that's in the regulations that address urban runoff and urban water, urban runoff quality, uh, this is some statistics that EPA frequently uses the urban runoff um, is impairing a very significant uh, total length of the streams and rivers in the United States, that it's impairing lakes, uh, estuaries, uh, coastal shorelines, and that these effects start to occur with very um, quite discrete changes in the landscape. So 1% to 2% development within a watershed, um, you start to see biological impacts in streams and then 15% impervious cover, and really quite profound things happen to water quality and loss of, uh, loss of function in, in uh, stream water systems. So regulation and management, next, next thing I want to touch on. Uh, since 1990, uh, there has been an effort under, as a part of the Federal Clean Water Act under Section 402P to address urban runoff through the MPDS or National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permitting framework. Um, in Orange County, we've been subject to permits for our storm drain system and the discharges from the storm drain system. Um, from uh, 1989, we, we got a jump on the regs. But the permits of, since that time have had two basic requirements that we shall eliminate uh, or effectively prohibit non stormwater discharges and we control pollutants from the storm drain system to the maximum extent practicable to the MEP. I'm sorry? MEP, what is that? It's a, it's a federal, it's a performance standard in these permits, maximum extent practicable. And over the years, there's been uh, paradigm shifts. In the, in the first years of the permit, 1990, the, fo the focus really was simply on eliminating non-stormwater discharges, discharges of waste, materials uh, dumped from, from businesses and other sources. And that was the, the, the principal motivation and the principal focus of the regulation and the obligation placed on local government and flood districts, 1990 and 96. Then in 2002, there was a major shift towards thinking about how we condition land development and building the urban landscape in a different way that was more protective of water quality. And then in 2009, a shift again, another paradigm shift, again a focus on land development, but instead of treat and release of runoff, retention of runoff. And this is where we start to um, get ourselves on a, on a course of merger with the water supply uh, industry. So in terms of reconfiguring the urban landscape to be protective of water quality, what you'll see now very much is this focus on low impact development. And if you recall, in the, in the big box um, uh, landscape scenario, we had 75% surface runoff, 5% uh, infiltration. Now we're seeking to be, reconstruct the urban landscape such so that we're getting back to a hydrology that is very much, much more reflective of the pre-development condition. And that some, of the, some of the things, green roofs uh, are part of the program, breaking up the imperviousness 
of the land surface such that runoff in parking lots is now directed into planters uh, and some of these surfaces themselves now are constructed as pervious rather than impervious surfaces. So in Orange County, uh, just like Los Angeles County, San Diego County, San Bernardino and Riverside counties, if you have a land development project as a consequence of these regulations um, and your project meets one of these threshold criteria, such that you're either creating 10,000 square feet of impervious surface or you're replacing 5,000 square feet of impervious surface, you're now caught up in these regulations that require you to have a water quality management plan for that project to get through the planning approval process. And that plan will require you to systematically think about how you're going to manage rainwater and stormwater on your site. So in the first instance, it's a, it's a hierarchical process of consideration. So you must think about on-site retention using infiltration, evapotranspiration or harvest and use systems. Uh, and if none of those are feasible, you can think about some bio-treatment, some treat and release of runoff, and then further consideration of regional alternatives, and lastly, possibly, payment of, a, of an in-lieu compens compensatory uh, fee. Time check. Okay, and if, um, just, uh, if, you, uh, if you've had breakfast at Norm's, anybody down by the freeway? No? Uh, my, my, my family weeps because every time we go there, I point out the parking lot. You know, that it's been constructed to drain to a little rain garden there and there are curb cuts. And it's, come and look at this, come and look at this. <laughs> All right. This is the last time they'll come to a lecture. <laughs> so, um, the, new the new paradigm for the last two or three years in Orange County, but uh, as I say, these regulations are... are, are are in place and are being affected in, in adjacent counties. Uh, you'll start to see projects that uh, look like this. This is uh, thanks to Gina Strada, my colleague at the City of Orange, uh, a parking lot. And you can see now that the runoff, the parking lot is configured such that surface water runoff drains to this planted area here. And if you were to pull back the asphalt or go back to the construction phase of that parking lot, you would see that they've put in this large uh, subsurface uh, retention facility so that the first almost uh, the first eight tenths of an inch that falls on that site now does not run off. It goes into this facility and it's uh, infiltrated to, into the, the local aquifer. We're also looking at how we change the surfaces that we create. This is a townhome project. You'll not just keeping everybody awake, yeah. modulate the volume. Um, but you'll see that this is a much coarser uh, aggregate. Um, it's uh, pervious concrete that is being poured. And this is what it looks like when it's finished. But uh, any rainfall falling on that surface just soaks straight into the ground, does not run off. And uh, Rich has a very nice uh, facility, the Inland Empire Utilities Agency is a model of low impact development practice and is open for people to go and look at the grounds. And then my colleague Jason Uli over at Riverside County Flood, uh, just off the 60 freeway at Market Street, their whole campus now is a, is a model low impact development project. And this is the, the progress that we have made in Orange County number of water quality management plans that we have approved since 2009-10. Um, it's been the new lid-based paradigm. So we have uh, almost 12,000 acres in Orange County that has been rebuilt using low impact development uh, principles. Now, where is this program going? There's been historically this focus on doing it on site in the first instance, but uh, when you look at Orange County, uh, this is the northern two-thirds, can't really see this laser pointer, 
the northern two-thirds of the county, we looked at where is it that you can safely do infiltration and where can you not do infiltration. And we started to screen out areas um, where there was existing subsurface contamination, contaminated groundwater, didn't want to exacerbate the problem there, didn't want to put water into the ground where we already have shallow groundwater, don't want to do it on slopes and potentially create some instability. So there are places where we want to do it and places where we don't want to do it. And in Orange County, um, I think it was Rich said, we don't want to do infiltration or it's not helpful to do infiltration, was it south side of the 10? Um, in Orange County, the great divide for us is the five freeway. And infiltration here for groundwater augmentation is very helpful, but west of the five, we're not, we're not helping with groundwater replenishment. Yes. So, <laughs> just one. <laughs> so these are the these are the key landmarks. This is the the five freeway coming down here. In here, you've got the Orange Crush Anaheim Stadium. This is the Santa Ana River coming up here, up to Prado Dam, right here, and the basin behind Prado Dam. So you've got uh, your Belinda, Brea across the top here, Los Alamitos down here, Huntington Beach, uh, Newport Beach, the Newport Harbor Complex, uh, and this is really about El Toro Road. City of Los Angeles, San Diego, uh, Baja down here somewhere. <laughs> Five minutes ago. So this this is where the this um, I find it gets quite exciting and quite interesting. Three minutes, all right. This is going to be a really exciting three minutes. <laughs> this this is where the pro the the program gets exciting for me. We are looking at the publicly owned public right of way that we could take use for regional infiltration of stormwater runoff. So if we could, and we're starting to map, remember John Wesley's watersheds. We have 11 major watersheds in Orange County. That are, see a bunch of them here delineated. But these purple, these purple splotches are publicly owned land, public, land in the public, pu publicly held. So we're starting to identify those, screen them for ones that would work for infiltration capture and groundwater replenishment, map the areas that are tributary to them, calculate how much additional stormwater could we capture the, those sites and use for groundwater augmentation. And what is interesting to me is a lot of those sites are school district sites. So that if we could offer money to a school campus to do a green classroom retrofit, but build some stormwater retention in underneath the baseball court or the, um, the baseball diamond, um, we're starting to get a virtuous circle there, a much greener campus, students interested in ecology, and a, and a sort of a feedback loop there, plus groundwater augmentation. So the next step for me in Orange County and my colleagues is to take uh, a small tributary area and see how it pencils out doing site-by-site -site stormwater capture for a basin just south of the Santa Ana River and how would that compare to doing it regionally in a central facility and then working out a fee schedule such that somebody doing a development project here could potentially pay for the upkeep of the basin or the green classroom retrofit in lieu of doing on-site mitigation. And that's a project we've got going over the next two years. <clears throat> so I'm running out of time, but in addition to changing the way we condition land development, we have a very active education and outreach program. And historically, we just put messages out there, hey peeps, these are the things you need to do to protect water quality. Um, oh, got some unanticipated uh, 
animation. But what we have found is that water conservation, uh, over the years, people have been convinced to be very shrewd and judicious with their 30 seconds. All right. Um, this is bacteria concentrations in Aliso Creek. They've dropped over the last 10 years to the point where, in dry weather, these creeks would support water contact rec recreation. And we think that is a consequence of water conservation. So instead of telling people, hey, here's some information, we're putting information out there and saying, what do you think? And trying to build an engagement one-on-one. -on -one. And you can follow this at overwatering. But this is where the insidious part of this comes in, that we can track people taking up the information and making the changes um, month to month, week to week, and seeing how effective we are. So summary, um, you can read that. I just wanted to leave you with one final thought. This is integrated water management circa 100 AD. This is a villa taken from a villa, a picture of an impluvium in a Roman villa in Sicily. It's, it sits underneath an open central atrium, so the rainwater that falls on the villa is directed to this area here. It falls, the water percolates through the cracks between the slabs, goes through some sand and gravel, and, and fills a cistern. So when the villa residents want water to drink, they have the, they have the slave stick a bucket down here, and you can see the little notch that was worn with the rope, and they go and pull the water out rainwater pre-filtered, pre-treated, there for drink. If it gets hot, they take some water out, they spread it here, it evaporates, you get evaporative cooling, and it becomes a very pleasant environment in these rooms immediately adjacent to the, um, the impluvium. And then finally, the bit that gets exciting for me is this works as a settling basin, so the rainfall comes in, the excess this thing is plumbed, so the excess is taken to the exterior of the villa, but all of the material that might have come in from the roof has settled out and it discharges clean boiling water. So with that, I'm 30 seconds over, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm Ken Manning, by the way. Uh, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what's going on, just uh, a little ways uh, to the west in the San Gabriel Basin, and uh, I'm executive director of the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority, and we've been working over there for a number of years now on a problem that uh, was found to be there um, back in the 1970s. But first, let's talk a little bit about what it is we're talking about. This is the San Gabriel Basin. The black boundaries are geologic. Not political, they're all geologic. And the people who reside within that black boundary all get most of their water, probably 80% of their water, from the groundwater within that black line. Now, outside of that black line, there's another group of people that to get water from that. There's about 800,000 people live inside the black line. But there's an additional about 4.5 or 450,000 people outside of that black line who also get water from the San Gabriel Basin. Now, Henry Barbosa, a little while ago, had mentioned that there was about 2 million acre feet. He didn't quite get it right. There's actually about 8 million acre feet, so about 10 times the, the quantity that's in Diamond Valley Reservoir. That's great, but you can't take it all. There's, you can only take what's, what's referred to as a safe yield. So this is a cross-section through the, the basin, and you'll notice that up in the, up in the hills, we've got three dams that are, that are outstanding uh, resources for us, and they're collecting, hopefully today, collecting a lot of water back behind those dams. And then when the summer comes and it gets a little dry, we start releasing that water down into the San Gabriel River, and we're able to actually percolate that into the ground. Now, groundwater pollution in the, in the San Gabriel Basin is, uh, is, a, is an issue, and it's an issue um, because of... The, the way this entire basin is laid out. The water as it comes down through the San Gabriel Basin, as we discovered groundwater pollution here in the San Gabriel Basin, if we don't clean up in the San Gabriel Basin what is our problem, then it's going to be the problem in the Central Basin. And so the politicians back in the early 1980s got together and uh, started talking about how they were going to solve that. This is a, just a, a, this is a picture was taken about 1914. 
over what would be considered about North Covina today, looking back towards Azusa Canyon. Um, we often think about the San Gabriel Valley as being developed, and it's always been developed. Well, this has evolved over years, and back in 1914, we were an agricultural community, mostly with uh, orchards, um, a lot of oranges, a lot of nuts. Um, still are a lot of nuts in the San Gabriel Basin, but, but a lot of nuts and, and, and actually some vineyards as well. This is another picture looking out off of the Covina Hills, looking out towards the San Gabriel Basin, and you can see that there's a lot of development of, ag of agriculture. So the history of the San Gabriel Basin is fairly interesting. In 1979, the basin was being thought about as a storage facility for the Metropolitan Water District. Great concept. We're going to put water in. During the dry years, we'll actually pull water out of the San Gabriel Basin and use it regionally. But when they started to do that, the science had changed, and so we were capable now of, of testing at parts per million. And so when they started testing the water in the San Gabriel Basin, they discovered that there were volatile organic compounds, TCE and PCE primarily, and they said, we got a problem here. So what, we, what happened was we brought in the EPA, and the EPA and the Department of Public Health in California started doing some, some testing along with the producers in that valley, and they, in 1984, put the San Gabriel Basin on the national priorities list. We know it as Superfund, and so the San Gabriel Basin at that time became a Superfund site. To this day, it is still the largest groundwater Superfund site in the country. It started off management with a JPA back in 1990. That didn't work so well. There was just too many people sitting around the table. Couldn't get anything done. So in 1992, the, a piece of legislation was passed that created a, a more streamlined version and became a state special district that is the whole uh, job of the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority is to coordinate and help fund the cleanup efforts in the San Gabriel Basin. This is a, a cartoon of the development of the San Gabriel Basin and why we have a problem. Back in the 1940s and 1950s, we started to see the San Gabriel Basin um, change. We started to see the city starting to grow, those orchards that we saw earlier starting to disappear, and we're, the lining of the channels, and so things are starting to change in the San Gabriel Basin. And of course, in the 1950s, as, as these uh, industries that were starting to come in as a part of the Cold War effort, started to dump their, their pollution or their, their chemicals on the ground. Now at the time, they thought that was great. They put it on the ground and a little while later they were gone, that was okay. Well, we know today that's not the way to deal with chemicals in the groundwater. So what happens is, is that as those uh, pollution gets through the Vado zone, the unsaturated zone down into our groundwater, it then starts to migrate. Of course, we've got pumps that are pulling water up. Um, serving customers in the, in the San Gabriel Basin. And as we start to pump, we're pulling that pollution towards those, those wells. And the, that creates a real problem, and we get these plumes of contamination. Now, in the 1990s, we decided the best way to solve this problem is we were going to use the existing wells that were in place, put in a few additional wells that were necessary, pump that water up, treat it, and serve it to the customer. That provided some real advantages. One, it provided some economics because you're serving water to the customers, the customer is paying for it, that helps offset cost. But also it didn't make sense to take that good, good groundwater and put it back into a polluted groundwater basin. And the theory is, is that over time that we would actually pump that water up, treat it, and over a period of time the groundwater basin would be clean. And that, in fact, will happen. But it's not as fast as this cartoon is working. It's going to take about another 40 to 50 years for that to occur. So we've got a lot of work to do. This is the San Gabriel Basin, again, that same black line, um, but it, you show some distinct areas. The first area is the Baldwin Park Operable Unit, and the Baldwin Park Operable Unit stretches from about Santa Fe Dam all the way down to about La Puente, and it follows the San Gabriel River. And it's the largest of our operable units, and it has a, a lot of chemicals in it. I'll talk about those in a minute. But it was, it, it's, it's this particular operable unit that was the focus of attention in the early 1980s. Since then, we've discovered we had additional problems in areas. The South El Monte. Now, we know these are different places because the chemistry, the signature of the chemicals in those areas are different. So we know they were introduced by different companies or different firms at different times. And you've got the El Monte operable unit just north of, of South El Monte. Pointe Valley operable unit. It's uh, still in, in, its wor in, in uh, work right now to be done. Um, then you've got Whittier Narrows. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, Whittier Narrows is a, um, a, what they call a fund lead program. That means EPA can't find the people 
or no, we can't find the people who were responsible for polluting that area. So EPA has in fact take on the, has taken on the responsibility to clean it up themselves. That, trans, that transferred over to the state of California about six months ago, and so that area the costs are being are born, born by the state of California. And then there's the Area 3 or Alhambra uh, operable unit, and it's a small area up in the, in the northeast of the, of the basin, and essentially volatile organic compounds, and again, the, the people who that were thought to be responsible for polluting that basin um, were, are very small, and, and most of them are gone. So again, EPA is probably going to end up caught paying for that one themselves as a fund lead. Now the contaminants vary, vary throughout the valley, depending upon whether you are in the Pointe, in the Pointe Basin is considerably different than the Baldwin Park operable unit. But a lot of the strategies that we use are still the same. That is, we're using existing um, wells that are being pumped. We're putting in strategic wells to get a capture zone, pumping that water up, and then treating it. Let me go back one here. We first, I said we first started with volatile organic compounds, and the VOCs that we found, mainly TCE and PCE, are cleansers. So as those businesses were cleaning those parts for the for the uh, uh, aerospace industry, they were just releasing those onto the ground. But in the 1990s, we started now treating for parts per billion. And we started to discover things that we didn't know were there. And so in late 1990s, 1996 to be exact, we started to find perchlorate, rocket fuel, in our groundwater. And then we found NDMA, which is also rocket fuel. And then we found 1,4-Dioxane, hexchrome, you name it, we've got a, a virtual soup of materials that are down in the groundwater. And so what, we, what that's done is it meant we had to go back in and retool all of our treatment facilities to make sure that they would treat this entire series of chemicals as they go through the process. Made it much more difficult and took us a, a time to, to, we had to delay things and get them uh, on, uh, on track again. So uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is that in uh, 1999, um, the, the county the Department of Public Health was, uh, was struggling with how were they going to deal with this treated water. We wanted to pump it up, treat it, and serve it to customers, but yet nobody had ever done that with perchlorate treated water that was laden with perchlorate. So we worked with the Department of Public Health, and in the San Gabriel Basin, we were the first agency to actually treat water to drinking water standards using technology to treat perchlorate and they developed the, the uh, standard of 97005 as the, the basis by which every agency now is held to uh, when they start to treat those kinds of contaminants. This is an overview of one of our facilities. This is in, in Baldwin Park. Um, you can see that what we are basically shoehorned into some existing communities here. So we had existing pumping facilities. The, the original plant that was pumping water was right here. This piece of property right here. That was it. The uh, water company had to come in and they purchased first all of this land here and they put in, this is a, uh, uh, a air stripping uh, system right here with carbon filters. Then it went through a, um, a process in here where the ion exchange um, resins, it exchanges the ions with the perchlorate, takes out the perchlorate. Then over in here we have um, uh, uh, or into here we have a UV system, ultraviolet light system, and then it goes into the tanks, blends with other water, and then goes into the potable water system. This system that we used in here now, we installed this about 11 years ago. State of the art. We're now taking it out. Because technology has changed such that it's actually cheaper for us to do ion exchange in a single pass system over here. This was a, this was a dual pass system. This is a single pass system, and so we're putting that in here. There's now a water tank on this, what looks like a helipad. And these houses that are here, they're now gone. And there's a complete nitrate system here. So now this water company now owns all of the land here and is treating water, and treating water at about 7,800 gallons per minute. This is another facility up right below uh, Santa Fe Dam by Valley County Water District. Similar kinds of facilities, tanks, air strippers. Um, you've got uh, tanks for, you got UV systems in, the, in here, uh, ion exchange going on. So the technology is very much the same. This is one I think is really the good news of what we've been able to accomplish over the last 20 years in the Water Quality Authority. Most agencies that have had groundwater quality issues in California, and I'll just use the Department of Water and Power as an example. Rather than treating the groundwater 
that they had polluted in the San Fernando Valley, they decided they were going to go and import additional water. They had three sources of, of water to import to, and so they, just, they went off of groundwater and started to import more water. San Gabriel Basin, we decided we weren't going to do that, and so what we did was we went out and sued the responsible parties throughout the San Gabriel Basin and all of those six operable units that we could find, and we came to, we came to negotiated settlements with all of them, and 72 cents out of every dollar that, that we spend on groundwater cleanup in the San Gabriel Basin is paid for by the responsible parties. And as you can see, the federal government, most of these were done under federal contracts. So the federal government has picked up about a little over 12 percent. Locally, we have an assessment that's about 11.5 percent, and then the state has, a response, has, has paid about 3.6 percent. The state is going to pick up additional costs in the future, and probably the local costs will go down, and probably some federal. But it's a success story that we've been able to achieve in the San Gabriel Basin that most basins have not. Now you've got the Department of Water and Power has finally found out they cannot import more water, and so they've got to go back to their groundwater basins. And so now they're starting the process that we begun actually 20 years ago. This is the two pie charts that show kind of the dollars and cents. And so if you look at this pie chart over here, this is the estimated cost. About $380 million is going to go towards capital improvements. We've spent most of that already. We've still only got about th uh, four or five more plants to build. Most of our expenses are in treatment and remediation. We estimate that it's going to cost about $1.3 billion to complete this process. That's in 2012 dollars, so this is going to go up over time. But $1.3 billion to clean up the basin. This section right here is a translation of that dollar bill into what we've already spent. And as you can see, we've spent well over $600 million in cleaning up the San Gabriel Basin. 72 cents on the dollar has been paid for by the responsible parties. This is the bad news down here, the green part. We're in negotiations all the time with our responsible parties, and we expect that that same 72 cents is going to be paying for that portion down there as well. But we've got about six, $700 million still to spend, raise and spend. Now this chart shows the treatment facilities starting when we began in, in the early 1990s. This is when perchlorate hit, and we had to, we had to uh, retool some of our plants. And we have been, been putting in facilities ever since. Today we have 31 treatment facilities, similar to what you saw on those two, those two aerials. We've got 31 of those facilities operating in the San Gabriel Valley, treating in those six different operable units. This is the, this is the really good, and I, I love to end with this, this slide. This blue line is the amount of water that we have treated over the 20 years. So far we have treated about 1.2 million acre feet. Now, somebody used the, the analogy, I think it was Henry as well, used the analogy of the, of the Rose Bowl. That would fill the Rose Bowl about 4,645 times. That's the amount of water we have pumped out of the ground, treated it to drinking water standard, and served to the public. Then contaminants pulled out. You can see this red line. This is the amount of contaminants that we've pulled out. We've pulled out over 70 tons of contaminants and taken those contaminants to EPA approved uh, landfill facilities and disposed of those facilities and we are continuing to pull out to this day and you can see the line is going up and our efficiency is getting better and we, we expect that line to continue to go up over time. And with that, that's the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority story. <clears throat>
watershed is located. So Inland Empire Waterkeeper is in charge of the upper Santa Ana River watershed. Orange County Coast Keeper is our parent organization. They are in charge of everything below the Prado Dam. What they came to realize after years of good work is that no matter how good their work was downstream, it was moot if we couldn't come up with stewardship and a control of contaminations upstream. And so Inland Empire Waterkeeper was born. And as I said, our geographical area of concern is from the Prado Dam to the origination. So today we're gonna to talk about um, the geography and ecology of the river and the watershed. Uh, then we'll go into what really I'm talking about today. You've heard a lot of technical information and we do deal with all of that as an organization. But what I bring to you today is the human side of this issue. Um, so what I wanna speak about is how the everyday citizen can relate to and take responsibility of the issues that we're talking about today. And that brings us to the women water warriors of the Santa Ana River. And then finally, um, we will talk about the current environmental challenges that are still facing the Santa Ana River and the watershed today. So where is this watershed? This is a picture of Mill Creek, one of the main uh, tributaries to the watershed. So the Santa Ana River originates in the San Bernardino mountain range, and it is, spans 110 miles from that crest into the coast, where it empties into the Pacific Ocean in Orange County. So, this watershed covers more than 3,000 square miles of San Bernardino, Riverside, and Orange County. Uh, it is home to over 200 species of birds, 50 mammals, 30 reptiles, 7 amphibians, and 15 different types of fish. We're going to come back to that last part. So here's a, a visual of, you can see, it's really impressive, 110 miles from crest to coast. So, renowned biologist E.O. Wilson once referred to this area that we're speaking about as one of 10 biological hotspots in the entire world. So why is that? If we think about the flora and fauna that reside there today, Many of all of those species I read to you are either endangered or threatened. We've got the Santa Ana sucker, so named because other than a few places in the San Gabriel, this fish exists nowhere else on this planet but in our Santa Ana River. Um, along with him, we have many other uh, threatened and some endangered species like Lise Belverio. who You see the cute little guy up on the right. He um, is falling prey to cowbirds who are predatory and eat the eggs and then lay their own so the poor unsuspecting Lise Valverio can raise their young, adding insult to injury. And then we just have a plethora of the most amazing wildlife that you can imagine lying hidden in an urban city, like great white egrets and great blue heron and turkey vultures, and the list goes on and on. But let's go back to that last Pesky animal. 4.8 million humans. So humans is what I'm really here to talk to you about today, people. And the Santa Ana River has a long and sordid past with people. Some of it not so great, but some of it really fantastic. And one such person, and these are some gorgeous vistas that you probably didn't know resided under the Van Buren Bridge in Riverside, One such person is Ruth Wilson. So let's talk about people, and more specifically women. The women water warriors of the Santa Ana River. So circa 1966, there uh, was a go-getter named Ruth Wilson who co-founded and at the time was president of the League of Women Voters. She had herself a good friend in a local uh, journalist named Martha McLean. Well, once Ruth's uh, turn at presidency of the League of Women Voters was over, a whole whopping three days that she had to rest, she received a phone call one morning from her journalist friend Martha McLean saying, you've rested on your laurels long enough, how about saving a river? 
Ruth, always up for a challenge, even today at 91 years old, said, why the heck not? So they went about with their friend Kay Black starting the Tri-County Conservation League. They started it in order to lobby to save the Santa Ana River. Now you might wonder, who was this looming threat? What was there to save? And the answer to that would be the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, <laughs> they're a much friendlier, kinder bunch these days. But at the time, Martha McLean, being a journalist, was privy to information before others and knew that the Corps meant to channelize this river, similar to the Los Angeles River and what we see today below Prado. Now, we don't know if this came into play in the reasoning, but it may have been part of the reason that the Santa Ana River, within the boundaries of Riverside County, has been largely closed off to its community for access for many, many years. Now, we know that the community does access it, I grew up in Riverside my entire life. I met and fell in love with my husband in that river. So I know that they use it. <laughs> but the agencies had various reasons for, di for discouraging this. A perceived threat of liability if someone were to be hurt. Um, the public, many of the public had the perception because of treatment facilities that that was sewage water. Um, there were many reasons. A lot of the community that borders the river are largely Spanish speaking. No signage was in place and no facilities and no signage in Spanish particularly. So what happened is we've created this area of river, this beautifully diverse area that I've showed you, where it's a scary looking place that no one is supposed to go. So as we started to figure out how can we raise water qualities in the Santa Ana, the first thought was get people swimming there because then they have to raise the quality. But we couldn't just say, jump in the water. So this is a multifaceted grassroots approach, and it's called ENCORE. And the acronym of ENCORE is Every Neighborhood Caring for Our River. And the reason it says ENCORE is this is what we see as the second act of those women warriors work. And I really believe that the only way to ensure longevity of cleanliness in the upper Santa Ana River is to give the river back to the people and give them a vested interest. I don't know if you've ever been to Riverside in July, but it's often around 110 degrees. Many of the communities that border this river are very, very socioeconomically disadvantaged, many below poverty level. It's 110 degrees, there is no feasible way to get to the beach, many houses don't have air conditioning, so where do they turn? To their river. So we realized that through outreach events like Swimmable California Day, we could have a tangible place to bring together agencies, NGOs, the public, and the press to start talking about firsthand this issue. So we couldn't just jump right in. The first thing we did was start testing. Through the help of Claremont, Pomona College, lots of different college students, we did bacterial testing and water quality testing in four areas along the river. And what we found was that at most times, we were near EPA standards for swimming already. So we knew that we could, with good faith, say to the people who were already swimming in the river, it's okay, it's okay to swim in the river. And we had something to bring to the table when we tried to reach out to historically um, not accepting agencies and governing bodies. So we needed to have something to talk to the elected officials about. And that's where we get into um, human use surveys, showing who's already there, and focus groups, finding out what people want from their river, if they want to be in it, if they're using it. And we're able to compile all of these things get the elected officials on board, show the agencies that people are using it and it can be done. And what you come up with is amazing days like Swimmable California Day. So Swimmable California Day was a resolution that Waterkeeper was able to get passed by the State Assembly, where on July 25th of every year, starting last year, Californians will celebrate how important it is to have clean swimmable waters. You'll see a lot of pictures of happy faces here because they've lived in Riverside their entire life and never been allowed in the river. And you see this young man with his caterpillar. And what you see here is Riverside's mayor with his children in the river. This is Rusty Bailey with his children and his wife 
and he was happy with a smile for the first time in the history of Riverside to stand in the river and say to several TV cameras, it's safe, it's good, and we're gonna make it even better. And so really what this boils down to again is people. Unless we give this community a vested interest in this river and this watershed and then the education to care for it, it doesn't matter how many agencies are working with so much technology and so much money to put out small fires. We're starting from the bottom level up and we're giving this river back to the community, teaching them how to care for it because we know that the story of this river and the problems it has today begin and end with its people. Well, another round of applause for our excellent panel. All righty, so we have some space now for questions and answers, and we again have the two microphones in, in each aisle. And so if, if you just raise your hand, someone will come to you with a microphone. I have a question about uh, river keepers. I travel through different parts of the United States and I see in lots of rural areas signage for watershed. And we do not do that here in California. We don't let the public know as they casually drive down the freeway or the off roads to the foothills of the mountains that they're in a particular watershed. And I think that would be a very useful project to undertake. I absolutely agree with you. So one of the programs that you notice me mention is education. And that comes in the form of us reaching out to school groups, K to 12, but primarily our focus at least recently has been high schoolers. We go out and we provide field trips to the watershed um, completely free. Substitute bus, everything. Because in California, if we don't pay the $100 substitute, they can't go. So when we do this, we're targeting STEM. We're going out and speaking to AP biology and environmental science students. The best of the best, so to speak. And every single time when I start with what watershed do you belong to, not one hand goes up. These are Ivy League bound children mostly. When I ask them what a watershed is, you maybe get two hands. So I agree completely and we're working day in and day out, um, one classroom at a time to do that. Um, and now you see us moving into larger efforts with, like we said, uh, non-traditional allies such as Riverside County Flood Control, who has stepped up and, and taken great strides to work with us to educate the public about the watershed. So I completely agree with you and what I would say is, support these programs. Um, the fact is, it's a hard time. We get no government help at all. We are completely privately donated. It costs $1,400 to send one class on a trip. And it doesn't just end there. We connect them with watershed science mentors who help them choose what career path they want and what courses to take. It is exponentially valuable, and it cannot be um, achieved without your help. Already has one there. I'd like to invite everyone here to uh, join a very local water initiative. It's called DRIP. Uh, it's the Drought Resistant Irrigation Program that's just starting up here in Claremont. The intention is to promote attractive, climate-appropriate landscapes in Claremont for residences and buildings, try to get the community engaged. About 70% of our water used here in Claremont in residences for irrigation. It's to promote efficient irrigation, water conservation, and water reclamation, and to create a network of local resources to provide information and services to property owners. Now, we had a handout uh, on the table. We had 50 of them. I don't think there are any left, but we have a sign-up sheet. And if you would like to learn more about this or get engaged in it, we hope that you'll sign up on the sign-up sheet. Just write information uh, after your name, uh, and we'll send you this information. Thank you, Freeman. Meryl, you have someone? <clears throat> Hello, I have a question that might be for Mr. Boone. Um, what are the opportunities that might be available to de-channel current 
water channels to make it the infiltration better. I'm just thinking locally we have little Thompson Creek, which is like a little cement channel. Can that be uncemented so that the water returns and it's a more of an ecological area? Does that have potential? I noticed you said about when they're replacing blacktop, they have to replace it with um, permeable blacktop. Can we just remove some of the impermeable surfaces? I'm not a warrior. So, so um, in, in flood control, um, I, I think it's a delicious irony that we refer to concrete channels as improved channels. <laughs> but hydraulically, they're very, very efficient. And the reason that they are concrete lined in many cases is because humanity has encroached on the floodplain and people want protection. And a stream in its natural state, as, as we saw from that picture of the alluvial fan in a, it wants to, wants to meander uh, across the, the landscape. And if you look at historic maps of Orange County, you can see how the Santa Ana River uh, meandered backwards and uh, side to side uh, across the, the coastal plain. So our ability to do channel restoration, some less intrusive, more ecologically sound configuration of the channel is wholly dependent on availability of land. Uh, so where you have wider uh, additional right-of-way, um, one of the things we will be considering as part of our planning efforts going forward is where strategically we can do some channel restoration. I, th I would think most likely in uh, regional parks where there are people that can take advantage of that opportunity. And then second, I think if we ever have a major blowout of a, of a channel, where there is major damage, there's loss of lining, there's damage to the adjacent properties, we might think, you know, there's no real point putting the same back in. We'll go with a softer ecological option, you know, in the, in the, in the, recon, in the post storm reconstruction. On the left there. Uh, so what can the Claremont colleges do to implement some of these innovative local resource strategies and increase local water supplies? Well, yeah, I, I talked a little bit about it, but again, um, the, the campuses with their new buildings, I think all the colleges, if every new building is a, is a state-of-the-art kind of a lead building, which is both water and energy efficient, um, obviously they're evaluating doing more with recycled water and then working with the Six Basin Water Master. I think there's a lot of opportunities, like Thompson Creek, which has been discussed in the city, uh, San Antonio Creek is how to capture stormwater better and utilize it. One of the not to get too wonky, but one of the technical challenges, um, historically, the aquifers here are kind of a La Cienega, and so when it's in a really wet year, they fill up, and so you have to very carefully manage the basin because we can, we can, like floods, it's the water problems. Sometimes we'll have too much, and the water table will rise, and some of the campus buildings will, the basements will have a problem. I, I think the question is, it, that, well, obviously this is a great one, and, and plays to the issue of this place here. Um, and what one can do. And I think part of the issue, um, as Freeman has suggested with DRIP, is that you start to reconfigure landscapes themselves. Um, and so one of the ironies, it seems to me, about my um, alma mater, Pitzer, is that they have not only built new dorms, but where they built them was in the wash that served as the replenishment zone for this broader thing. And so, um, you know, it got lead gold and silver and platinum and stuff like that. But in the end, the downside is you actually lost a huge ecological value. Um, and so what you have to do now is to technologically replace that process, which is also expensive to do. Um, but it does seem to me that, that, that where these built out areas are, and we saw this wonderful overhead aerial view of the San Gabriel Valley, um, the impervious surface, including roofs, constitutes an enormous amount of, of the landscape in this area. And what we want to do is to punch holes in the concrete because that's, that's essentially why you save the Santa Ana River, and it's why you try to do these other kinds of things. And so places with resources that can do it, um, it seems to me, is a, is a kind of real ecological responsibility to start to do that, and the colleges are well fixed to do that. Uh, question to the audience. How many of you have more than two rain barrels? 
<laughs> because the 85 percentile is usually equated to three quarters of an inch. However, if you have a thousand square foot roof, you're generating 400 gallons for three quarter inch rainfall. I've already emptied all of my eh, almost 420 gallons three times already during this last rainstorm. The issue is most of the cities, save for single family dwellings, you only need two rain barrels because it's a political issue. Because have you ever seen 400 gallons of storage? <laughs> That's a lot of rain barrels, eight, 12, maybe. So one of the questions on the LID, how many cities actually require stormwater capture equivalent to three quarters of an inch for the single family dwellings? LA doesn't, and from what I understand, LA County doesn't. Richard? So the answer to your question is non do unless you have a really big home, unless you, unless you live in South Orange County where you have the, the mansions with the helicopter pads, um, it's unlikely that the regulations right now are going to come down to the level of requiring rainwater capture on single family homes. There's but, a place for some, some effort. But it, I, I, as somebody that's involved with, involved with that program, I, we, uh, to make sure that that dispersed, disaggregated green infrastructure works and continues to work, as soon as those features are built into a project, that project goes into a database and we, uh, go, year after year, go out and inspect and uh, verify the, the the features are still working, and I, I, I'm not prepared to go out and inspect single-family homes. Thank you all for speaking. Um, I was wondering, um, well, first off, these are really exciting sort of ways that you are remedying sort of errors from the past in development, um, and sort of looking with an eye towards the future then, if climate change forecasts are as they predict and precipitation levels decrease, um, what kind of initiatives are you taking to um, create sort of an infrastructure for that? And um, do, you, do you think that then sort of importing is necessary or do you think sort of an eventual migration is inevitable? Thank you. Yeah, just a quick background. Um, the, the state water plan has climate change. The Department of Water Resources working with water districts and cities throughout California. In 2015, everybody's required when you update your urban water management plan, you'll be doing that here in Claremont and Three Valleys Municipal Water District. We're talking about it for this whole service area. It's about climate change and resiliency and adapting to uncertain climate, extreme weather. I mean, obviously we think about not just droughts, but also the intensity of storms and all that. Uh, much like, if you remember a couple of years ago, Pasadena went through quite a shock when they had this huge windstorm that knocked out electricity for six days. Can you imagine if you knocked it out so you had no water and electricity for a week? So utilities are developing um, their future plans based upon climate change and the uncertainty of extreme weather events. Let me, um, if I can, also kind of build on that. Um, first of all, when you talk, we talk about, you know, problems or, or mistakes of the past, I keep telling my colleagues, I just bet you anything that in 40 years from now, that next generation is going to go, I can't believe those guys did that. Now, I don't know what that is, but there's something we're doing that I'm sure is not, is not going to be... Um, thought of very highly in about 40 years. But what I think in terms of the future of, of water is, is that if you see, you're starting to see an evolution. Going back 30 years ago, water agencies didn't talk to each other. They didn't collaborate with each other. They didn't share with each other. It was absolute fiefdoms. 
And what you're starting to see now is the realization that we can't survive in the future that way. And whether it's additional conservation kinds of activities, we're all talking to each other about best management practices and how we're going to improve, and we're building. We're looking at Orange County and seeing what they do right, and they're looking at us, and we're looking in Northern California and seeing what we can, we can steal for those guys. And then we're inventing some new things. And it's, you're starting to see this collaboration that I think is going to, I think, evolutionize, evolutionize how we deal with water in, in California. There's no doubt in my mind that Northern California, we've seen this, they, we heard about the statistics in the last panel about how they're using so much more water than we are in Southern California. This drought hit them hard. This is the first time anybody in Northern California has ever had to talk about drought, but yet they had to finally start talking about voluntary measures in Northern California. They're going to start linking about what they're doing in Northern California. That's a good example. So I think though that's the really, as I look at, we're, we're doing little things here and there, but I think the biggest change is, is that we're collaborating with each other on best practices. A question here? No? Get your mic working there. I'm an expert on water, but uh, I've lived in the area all my life, I, and I've done, I'm interested in from what I understand, Prado Dam is, was built for flood control for, for Orange County, uh, for particularly Huntington Beach, a 150 year flood or what have you. And uh, when we have a El Nino year and it floods, it, it's a huge lake behind uh, Prado Dam, but it quickly is drained. And I was wondering if there, is there any plans on access, using that water more efficiently, to, maybe for, for charging the, the, our aquifers here? Yeah, it, it is used for that. In fact, what happens is, is the Orange County Water District works very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers who owns and operates Prado Dam. And they work with them so that they, the storm event we just had in the last two days, they store up to about 10,000 acre feet behind Prado Dam. And over the next couple of weeks, they'll really set slowly. And those pictures that you saw Richard point out, those, uh, Percolation ponds in Anaheim along the river, that's, they re release that water behind Prado, and they do that every year. They really do a first-class job of trying to deal with it. One of the challenges we have with Prado, um, and one of the fun facts, it's the largest freshwater uh, wetland in Southern California created by the dam, but it's, it's a, a great habitat. But what happens with these big storm events, it's been filling up slowly with sediment, and they're losing more and more of that. And one of those challenges when you have the dam there is we need to sluice out or clean out that sediment behind that dam. And it's the same challenge they have, LA County has up on the San Gabriel River and frankly, right here in your backyard. Um, I know locally we're frustrated that the Army Corps isn't spending the money on the maintenance behind San Antonio Dam because it's filling up with sediment too. That's an ongoing maintenance problem. You want to balance that Certainly you don't want to increase any flood risk down to Orange County, but we do store water behind Brado Dam. And under the water rights of the Santa Ana River Watermaster in the adjudication back in 1969, when it gets to Prado Dam, then it flows to Orange County and they put it in the groundwater basin and they drink it. Garb. We understand in Claremont that all of the cities are going to be required to treat their storm water drainage this year and not send it to the ocean until it's been so treated. What I want to know is, is there any consolidated effort in Los Angeles County and in all these foothill communities to try to do something with that water other than send it into the ocean? And I especially wanted to ask Mr. Atwater, but I thought Mr. Boone seemed to have some ideas on that line too. I think what I'm thinking is that the, a lot of these communities ought to get together in a major plan. That's a really good question. Um, the MS4 stormwater permit for LA County is a little bit complicated, but it was adopted about a year and a half ago. And you're absolutely right. The city of Claremont is working with adjacent cities on this new term. It's an enhanced watershed plan. And we talked about in the earlier presentations about you know, the governance at a watershed scale. For the local watershed, you're, you're doing uh, a, a, a watershed plan with the adjacent cities. There's no deadline this year. In another 18 months, they have to complete that enhanced watershed management plan where they come up with a collaborative plan with the adjacent cities, working with LA County Flood Control District 2, and, and, and coming up with the best management practices, really the kinds of ideas and, and the, the, 
what's the most cost-effective package that Richard Boone talked about? Same kind of thing that they're doing in Orange County and in Riverside and San Bernardino County. Um, it's just under their permit, um, they allow the cities to do this, which I think is really smart, is to do these cooperative, multi-city watershed plans to come up, how do you work together to have green streets, green infrastructure, bioswells, all of that to make sure that they meet the water quality requirements. Yeah. Wait, before you insist, Lil, get the mic. <laughs> Megan, I want to congratulate you on your can you hold Can you hold the mic a little closer? Lil, can you hold the, the mic a little closer? I, I love what you Hello, can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, um, I'll start again. I want to congratulate you on your presentation. Well, you. I love what you had to say. I loved your enthusiasm. Your photographs really have helped bring this whole wonderful conference alive. And I, I was a bit angry at first. I saw you up there with all the chaps, and I thought, now, in the good old days, days she'd be the first speaker. <laughs> ah, you know, I couldn't resist that. But then, in a way, I saw that what you had to say really brought life to this conference, and Andy, and I think you probably handled all that very well. Um, it, it was just a joy to see the families there, and, and you know, it's made me feel interested in water, and I only got that shot when I listened to you. So it's important. Thank you very much, and thank you, Andy, for a great show. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, and I think probably I was scheduled last because there are several cohorts here who know my um, rambling ways. Uh, but I want to say that I intentionally kept this talk about the feel-good portions of this river because these men are working very hard on the infrastructure parts and on the parts that are technical and that only a certain demographic of our population is going to be able to understand and implement. Um, and I really don't think that there's any longevity without the common citizen. Um, and so I hope to be, and Inland Empire Waterkeeper, to be that bridge. So thank you for your appreciation. Absolutely. Gar? The best for last. I have a question it's very loud. Um, about the treatment system in San Gabriel for the contaminated groundwater, which was really impressive, the pump and treat and distribute system that's going on. And I was thinking about the contaminants that you're working with, which are all napples and dense napples, and um, the potential problems with any, I don't know what has been done for source characterization, but if it turned out to be the case that those plumes that you're cleaning up are actually much more persistent and couldn't be cleaned up over 40 years, but maybe would take, oh, I don't know, 200 years if there's a lot of napple down at the bottom of the aquifer. Um, do you think that this kind of system where you are actually treating the groundwater, contaminated groundwater, and then using it as drinking water is economically feasible? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think, I, think it's, I think it's the most feasible way to do it. And in terms of the question of, of you know, sustainability of cleaning, um, and we have estimated um, 40 to 50 years that it's going to take to clean it up, but that's predicated on some assumptions. And a couple of those assumptions probably we already know are not going to be true. And one of those is that the MCLs for the contaminants that we're treating for are going to stay consistent there's already moves afoot to change those and lower those maximum contaminant limits on some of these. And if that's the case, then we will be treating for a lot longer than that. The second is, is that within that unsaturated zone, the Vado zone, as the groundwater goes up and down, we find that, that some of our, our limits will actually get better. We'll, our contaminants will actually go down as, as the groundwater goes down because some of the stuff is left up here. As it comes back up, it, it, uh, it, it captures that water, that, those contaminants again, and brings it back down into the aquifer. And so we end up with higher spikes, spikes again in, in, our, in our groundwater. So we still don't know exactly what's in there and how long it's going to take for all of that to migrate. Now, there's been a lot of effort on cleaning up source contamination. A lot of work's been done. I don't think there's been enough, but there has been a lot of work, and we don't know what's still in that unsaturated zone. So the, like I said, those two assumptions we already know probably are not going to be there. So when I say 40 to 50 years, that could easily be a lot longer than that even. But what I think is happening is that, is that what, because of the groundwater and the contaminant limits in a lot of these, I think that you're going to see areas that think that they're clean are going to continue, are going to eventually end up with groundwater cleanup on those 
for things that they're not finding yet. Because as we're starting to test at parts per trillion now, um, then we're starting to react to those kinds of limits. And so I think you're going to find that over time, there's, there's going to be very little water in California that's not treated for something. How to pay for that? Tough one. Yeah, hello. I'm a little bit concerned about whenever humans tamper with the environment and the planet Earth. And I think someone said earlier this morning that no one knew what happened when we emptied the aquifers. And I know that water is heavy and it exerts pressure. And I know that California has a problem with seismolo seism seismography. <laughs> if that's the word, fault lines and earthquakes. And if we tamper with emptying the aquifers, do, is there any research, is there anywhere else on the planet where uh, we've depleted uh, an aquifer and it has caused a sinkhole or a collapse in the earth uh, that we can look at with happy eyes or sad eyes? <laughs> There's, there's a lot of um, evidence, um, and lo some of it locally here, of, of times where we've actually, okay, where we have actually um, depleted the groundwater basin, either in a sub-basin or within a basin that has actually caused um, subsidence. Now, there's a famous photograph in the San Joaquin Valley with a guy standing next to a pole that shows what the elevation of the earth, of the ground was in, in the 1920s, and he's 20 feet below that. So, so there are, we do know that when you pull groundwater out without replenishing it, that you're going to cause problems. Now, in terms of seismic activity, um, I happened to speak this morning at, the, at uh, Assemblyman Chris Holden's event just up the street here, and one of the ladies from Caltech was there talking about that very ish issue. And there are a lot of things that could trigger small to medium uh, seismic events. And I would guess that probably um, depleting aquifers, because it relieves the stress, it relieves uh, amount of amount of pressure, um, that it probably could create it. But I don't know for I don't know for sure. It's out of my expertise. But but in terms of just local things, um, there are a lot of evidence of them, and I, I know others have probably had heard of those as well. The, the one that I I'm and both Rich and I dealt with over in the Chino Basin was in the area of Chino. There was a, about, a, about a two foot uh, subsidence event that occurred in the, in the city of Chino that we caught and, uh, and we then in, implemented some, some uh, acts, things in terms of offsetting pumping so that they weren't pumping from the area where that was occurring. Yeah, you know, um, when you start tapping into groundwater basins, there, you've heard the term probably safe yield, um, and uh, safe yield generally uh, says is a, is a theory in terms of the amount of water that is replaced naturally into a groundwater basin, and that's usually what, if you're in an adjudicated basin, that's the maximum amount of water that could be taken out of that basin in any given year without being replenished, so. I think we'll take two more questions, one from each side. Over there on the left, please. We've had a marvelous exposure today to everything technical and personal about water. I find one thing that I'd like to add briefly. Please be sure to deep water your trees at the level around the drip line will be fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, the eastern states have contaminated rain, which they refer to as acid rain. Our rain blows in from the Pacific Ocean, but we're downwind of L.A. How pure is our rain? Um, I, I, none of the water quality. I don't think there's anything from L.A. From I mean, There's some dust and other particles that come down. I think, frankly, the one thing that um, is a concern when we capture and... And, and, and recharge stormwater is particularly after the hot summer months, the first couple of storms in the fall, this winter we didn't have hardly any rain, um, you got lots of oils and grease, um, things like from the brake linings, copper, other metals, 
Um, there's other things, trash on the streets. And so one of the things we worry about is, and we sample for that, is we try to, um, the stormwater can be dirtier, if you, for example, than the treated recycled water that we recharge in the same aquifers. And some of the things we do is we have ways of desilting basins, we build wetlands and other things to kind of filter and treat that water. Or in some cases, we actually let the stormwater go by the recharge pond because it's too dirty and let it go to the ocean. It's just, um, and that's partly what you know Richard's job is. That's what they're trying to do is develop more programs so that you can eliminate some of that pollution from the urban runoff. But it's always a challenge because people do lots of things on the streets and nobody, you know, that sort of thing. In general, rainwater, roof water, that's a common thing to capture. And frankly, if you put in a rain barrel at your house, you're capturing off your gutter, and that's what you do. And it, normally, that's pretty clean. But we're not using it for drinking water. Um, generally, what you do is you use it like a gray water. You're just using it for irrigation. There are places back east where you get rainfall more often. They actually take the roof water and they do a, a level of treatment and they have used it for their purposes like in Philadelphia. But it's not that common here because it doesn't rain that often. Alrighty, well I think we've ended with this, this session. If I can have a round of applause for our panel and for all your <laughs>